Hi, everyone. Welcome to Tuesday Night Rheumatology. Tuesday Night Rheumatology is a series that we run every Tuesday night, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, 4 p.m. Pacific Time. And this month, we're featuring a host of topics related to psoriatic arthritis. Today, we're going to focus on patient perspectives. This one's called What Patients Say About PSA. So we're glad that you're joining us. Uh, I'm going to ask my other panel panelists to unmute and activate their cameras. Here we are, the Cozy Four. So I want you to know I'm joined by Tina Brown, Ashley uh, Krivolavik, and Chris Lindsay, um, all of whom are patients with psoriatic arthritis, uh, all of whom have been advocates for healthcare, for patients and PSA and psoriasis for many, many years, um, all of whom are still active in this arena. Um, I think chronologically, I first met Chris Lindsay back, Chris, I think it was like 2000. It was, it was earlier than that, Jack. It was 1998. Oh my so, goodness. Yeah. yeah. The beginning yeah. of the biologic era. Back then, Chris and I were doing studies and developing anakinra for use in rheumatoid arthritis. Chris has a long career um, um, that started with her origins in British Columbia. Then somehow she made a left turn and ended up in Texas where she uh, works a clinical pharmacologist in Dallas. If I didn't move her until she moved out West and, and joined um, Amgen um, and was working on the development of multiple drugs. Uh, and so she's had many roles, you know, including vice presidents and heads of physician um, relations. And, um, you know, I, I, guess, I guess I can't really go into how many, but um, all of which has been really influential, both in drug development, in physician development, uh, educator development, and in clinical trials. Chris worked many years for Amgen, then went on to work for Orinia and to help develop focal sporin. And, and now the company you're working for, Chris? Arcutus, Arcutus Biotherapeutics. Working, working in, in the dermatology space. Dermatology, Again, yes. Chris, like everybody, has been in both the arthritis and the dermatology space for many years. So thank you very much, Chris. And, and, and only in the last few years have I got to learn that Chris is, um, is herself a patient. Um, next, Tina Brown. Tina Brown was a patient of mine for many, many years until I... My practice changed. Let's not go into that, Tina. But, yes. Yeah, she's her. her I'm not story, happy with you about that. Yeah, she, her story is I've abandoned her, but yet she's here. Um, she's unique. Um, I want to say that you know her career has been spent really as an inspirational and motivational speaker. I think she is to dermatology and psoriasis what Tony Robbins is to anybody who's got a problem. Yes, I watched Tony Robbins last night, and I thought he's got nothing on you, Tina. Oh, um, what a sweet thing to say. Well, I mean, how many people can make me cry and laugh in the same visit? That would be sure. her. Um, again, truly um, um, a giant in my mind. She's educated nurses and physicians. She's spoken at major medical centers like the Mayo and Geisinger and the, even the FDA. Um, her and Chris were both patient speakers at Room Now Live um, two years ago and really just killed it. Um, offering their unique patient perspectives. Next, Ashley. Ashley, I just got to meet in the last month or so when I was talking to my friends at Creaky Joints and said, I need someone great. And they didn't hesitate. And Ashley was their first um, person to mind. Ashley's on the board of uh, Global Healthy Living Foundation. She also is a regional um, co-director or co-chair uh, for the National Psoriasis Foundation. Since she was diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis, she's been very involved in advocacy, teaching, writing. She's a bit quite an influencer in her own way. And we're actually, we're really glad to have you join this panel. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me and nice to meet everybody. All right, so folks, the way this is gonna work is I'm gonna ask our panelists to give like an opening monologue. And then I want you, the participants, to write down your questions for them in the Q&A section, okay? Don't use chat, use the Q&A, okay? That's very important here. We're recording this. We're going to make this available on Room Now. 
uh, as early as tomorrow. Um, so you can tell your friends what they missed tonight. Next week, we're going to have another Tuesday Night Rheumatology. And next week, it's going to be Journal Club. And I think you're going to really like that. We're going to cover two major seminal articles in PSA that came out in the last year. Um, and we're going to have a discussion group of four people. Two articles, four people, one hour. It should be full of good information. So let's start with um, Tina. Thank you, Dr. Kush. Thank you for uh, having me be a part of this wonderful panel. And I'm thrilled to be able to share with your participants on this call. So I'm a psoriasis patient and a patient advocate. So when I do my talks for physicians, I tell, I have a slide that says, I have a PhD, a positively horrible disease, had it for over 50 years. So I think that qualifies me as an expert. So um, I do the work that I do today because for many, many years growing up with psoriasis, I've, I've had really severe psoriasis and then developed short, psoriatic arthritis shortly after that. And unfortunately, when that when that began with me, there weren't a lot of treatments and options available. So I had a lot of really severe struggles with going to the doctors and finding good health care and people that understood my condition. And um, so I said, when I was younger, after I had a really bad experience with my very first rheumatologist, I said, wow, when I get older, I really want to share the importance of compassion and empathy in patient care. So my name is Tina, T-E-N-A, and I tell people the E is for empathy because to me, it's one of the most important qualities that uh, we really need in healthcare. And it, it's no secret to anybody here that we need more compassion and empathy. So I travel around the country. I educate dermatologists. I, rheumatology is new to me, although it's something I've always wanted to, to do was talk to rheumatologists because that first experience when uh, a rheumatologist gave me a really bad experience, uh, it altered the course of my life. So Today, I educate and talk about compassion and empathy and the role that it plays and to try to help people truly live up to their full potential, regardless of what healthcare experience that they have. Because as we all know, it's hard enough just getting through life when you're healthy, but when you're living with a chronic disease and in particularly psoriasis and or psoriatic arthritis, when you have a disease that other people see, it really changes the emotional aspect. So I think this conversation is so important. I love advocacy. I too um, have worked with the National Psoriasis Foundation for many years, done a lot of workshops with them. So um, this work is extraordinary and it's necessary. And we need about three gazillion more of us ladies on the panel to spread the word of compassion and empathy. And um, I just can't thank you enough for Dr. Kush to bring this conversation to the forefront because it's a conversation that really needs to happen. So I've been working out the rest of your acronym being a straightforward talking girl from Oklahoma, like Ashley, the NA stands for you don't tolerate, won't take no asses. <laughs> rephrase that however you want. <laughs> Tina, I think she comes to her own defense. She speaks her mind. She's quite demanding um, of what she wants out of her positions. And I think that's why, you know, when I open that door and walk in to see her, I'm I better be awake. Otherwise, I'm going to get it across the head. Um, and there's, I have my things I want to discuss. She has her things. So, but, Don't you think um, that's why it worked, Dr. Kush? Because we were both right there ready. And I just have to say to the, to the audience, I hadn't seen a rheumatologist in 40 years. And I found Dr. Kush. And I just fell in love with him because he was strong and he was direct. And we just connected instantly. So... I wouldn't say this to your face, but I think you're an amazing, extraordinary it, doctor. It, it, it took three visits for me to surrender, but um, <laughs> I ultimately did. Ashley, you have the microphone. <laughs> so thank you, everyone, Dr. Kush and Tina and Chris. I'm just thrilled to be in, on this panel and hopefully to learn from everybody. Um, I'm, I'm kind of just starting advocacy. Um, arena and so many of the things that you guys have already done are things that are goals of mine. So um, hopefully I'll be able to attain the level of advocacy that everybody on here has had. <laughs> but my journey kind of started uh, when I was 12. I got diagnosed with uh, psoriasis of the scalp and I had a journey trying to figure that out. <laughs> um, went to primary care and then finally to a dermatologist who said it's this. 
it was in remission for many years and um, I still, I don't have a whole lot of uh, skin activity, but when I turned 30, I was diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis and it was literally on my 30th birthday. So that was a great birthday present to me. Um, so I took a few months, kind of cried around about it, <laughs> you know, and then decided I had to start doing something. So, um, my maternal grandfather had rheumatoid. Um, I have a maternal aunt who passed from lupus complications and my mother has just been recently diagnosed with rheumatoid. So all in the family. And uh, mom just actually had her knee replacement as well. So that's been interesting from that side of things. Um, but I really am proud of the work that, that I'm doing right now. Um, advocacy and, and fighting for patients, whether it's, you know, getting your medication um, or, uh, just making sure that they have a voice, even if it's just in the doctor's office. Um, that is my goal uh, going forward. And um, I, like Tina, I'm sure probably Chris too, we all had our fair share of, uh, you know, you got to go through rheumatologists. And right now I'm really happy with mine. Um, uh, she's actually a nurse practitioner. So I don't actually see a rheumatologist or doctor. Um, but my nurse practitioner is great and I'm very, I consider myself very lucky. Um, especially in Oklahoma where rheumatologists are few and far between. <laughs> so that's kind of my background. You know, luckily all three of you do live in areas where, well, Tina actually has to drive quite a ways to get care. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, lately I've been talking to a lot of rheumatologists, a lot of primary care docs, and that's a big complaint out there. Yeah. There are not enough rheumatologists, and that's a real concern. Um, Chris, go ahead. Absolutely. Thanks, Jack, for the opportunity to be with these uh, lovely women um, here to advocate and share their stories. Uh, Tina and I had a lot of fun a couple of years ago, so looking forward to the same uh, tonight. I, you know, hey, that's how I chose to, everyone asked me, I left California, moved to Texas, and one of the reasons was healthcare, right? There's a great group of doctors here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area and a lot of access to great healthcare. And I think that as a patient with a chronic disease like this, that's something you think about, you know, um, I could go live in the middle of nowhere and have a lot of fun, but I wouldn't be close to the healthcare that I probably need to, to take care of myself. But um, you know, my um, disease experience uh, started not long after I met you, Jack, in uh, 99, a lot of stress at work, right? Found out I had psoriasis and found out everyone in my family did too, which no one talked about, right? Like that is not shared. If you can't see it, no one's going to talk about it. Um, I was the unlucky one who was diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis about seven years later. So very consistent with everything you read about the, the time course of psor psoriatic disease and, and how that develops. And, and I've been working as a, uh, with GRAPA, the group for psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis, as a patient research partner for many years. And there's sort of a, a few things, um, you know, learnings and things just from my personal experience and from talking to others with psoriatic arthritis. And, you know, a couple of things I'd just love to share, Jack, with the group that's on, on the phone. First of all is, you know, Tina's empathy can't be reiterated enough. Every patient will tell you the day where they were when they were diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis, they remember it vividly. And while you may see 15 patients in a day and think nothing of giving someone a diagnosis and running a lot of labs and bringing them back in, that moment is life-changing. It's said the same in oncology and in other disease states, it is a life-changing pivotal moment for those patients. I will never forget it. And the empathy at which my physician um, handled it and reached out and held my hand and told me we were in it together, it still brings tears to my eyes because that was really special. 
And I think there are a lot of patients who don't have those same experiences. And it's why they go to find another doctor because they're struggling with that diagnosis and someone who want, who can appreciate the life impact that it's had. The, the second thing that has struck me over the years with a little bit of humor, because heck, you got to have humor, right? Um, this is something, you, you know, you didn't ask for, but you're going to deal with is the, the role of your family and, and how doctors can take into um, account the family. And I, I always like to say, like, you see 1% of all the noise that's in my head, because I've got all these people behind me asking me questions, crazy things, right? Still to this day, you know, uh, I should take turmeric and I should do this and I should change my diet and I need to take more collagen or my husband who wanted us to go vegan for the summer. Um, we didn't last long because I said, Hey, if I got to go vegan, you go vegan. And anyways, you know, so that whole family dynamic and empowering patients, right? So the empathy and empowerment for them to be able to answer questions that their family is asking them. So they need to leave educated in a way that they can stand up to the people who maybe say, I don't think you should take an injectable or I don't think you should do this or you should do that and are questioning the doctor's advice because patients and doctors are sharing in those decisions together. And yet outside the patient needs to have that, that opportunity. Uh, and, and I, sometimes I think physicians maybe forget that there's all these other people that are just in your head the whole time, which might lead to maybe non-compliance questions through charts and things like that. And then, you know, Jack, you sort of said it right before we got on the line, right. Um, you know, fatigue and feet, right. So in rheumatoid arthritis, it's very easy to do a joint count and never look at someone's feet. It's not as important. You can do it with just the hands. But in psoriatic arthritis, my disease was mostly in my feet and in my ankles. And, and I needed a physician who was willing to look at my, my feet, right? And I, I worked hard to get them clean and to show up in the office, right? But the feet are really critically important because there may not be as many swollen or tender joints in a patient with psoriatic arthritis. You got to hunt for them a little bit and find them. And the doctor who never wants to look at my feet is a doctor where I go, hmm, I wonder, like, do they understand the disease process and that difference? So, um, we can talk more about fatigue and what that role plays. And I'm sure many of us have stories about that, but let's just say it from a patient perspective. And as a healthcare professional myself, I never appreciated what fatigue really felt like until it hit me like a train. And it wasn't just like the flu. It was the flu that didn't go away. It was this, this inability to cope or to get off a couch and it wasn't laziness, right? It, it was systemic. And that is a really hard feeling to explain to a doctor and to be taken seriously about, right? When you say you're tired or you have this fatigue. Um, and so I would ask doctors to really question a little bit. And my doctor was awesome because we would talk about, well, the gradations of fatigue. Well, how long before you ended up in the couch and how long could you work during the day? And when did you go to bed and were you getting enough sleep and all those factors to narrow down, was it disease or was it external processes that were playing a role there? Because that fatigue is, is real. It's life changing and impacting and can be improved with the right therapies. Yeah. So maybe that's our first big question I want to ask. Um, and you guys can jump in and ask each other questions as well. But I want to, fatigue is a big thing. Um, it's a, become a much bigger thing um, because the companies study the, dis the diseases. They study it by talking to doctors. They talk to patients. And they're getting this overwhelming message about fatigue from patients. And docs know it. But we kind of think that if I control your inflammation, if I give you the medicine for the disease, then, then everything takes care of itself. The pain goes away, the fatigue goes away, you're skipping through the lily fields um, you know, to good music and, uh, and, and they look good. But that's not always true. So how do you get a doctor to pay more attention to fatigue when they think that they're doing their best by giving you, you know, the latest and greatest of therapies?
such a great question. Um, I know, Chris, whenever I heard you speak at, when we spoke together at Room Now a few years ago, you were the first person, and I've been in this role for many, many years, that really spoke to the significant role of fatigue. I have terrible fatigue, and I'm an extremely high energy person. And when I tell people that this is me at about 15%, it scares people. But I am, I am extremely fatigued. And then I had COVID two years ago. So on top of my regular psoriatic arthritis fatigue, I've had COVID fatigue. So I, I've needed naps two to three times a day. And it's very frustrating. It's hard to get work done. My mother used to set out, say I would smother a lazy child. Neither my brother nor myself have a lazy bone in us. And it's something that every single day I have to address. And I have to do so many additional things in my health care, make sure I'm hydrated, make sure I have enough water, make sure I'm eating healthy, make sure I'm getting proper sleep. Like all of these lifestyle managements go into helping me manage my fatigue. It's just as important to manage as my other comorbidities and other issues I'm dealing with. So for me, to answer your question, Dr. Kush, having to just be able to take that time to explain to my physician this is a big part of what I'm experiencing. And I, I understand as a patient, y'all don't always have all the answers, right? I know it's frustrating for y'all sometimes to deal with a patient sitting here saying, look, I'm fatigued, I'm exhausted, I'm worn out, uh, being able to give us the proper advice. So I just want you to know from a patient's perspective, I have empathy for my caregivers as well. And I don't expect you to have all the answers each and every time, but I do hope very sincerely that you will hear me and understand that this is another big piece of my compliance and following through with, with my treatment protocols. Dealing with the fatigue is, is, is devastating many, many days. So when we hear that, you know, we're going to go through the checklist of other medical problems that cause fatigue, med- medicines that may cause fatigue, sleep problems that, cause, that may cause fatigue, depression may cause fatigue. And, you know, other than giving you our, our medicines, do you think that the docs answer that question well enough or do they throw it back on you and don't give you a lot of op- options? That's for Chris and Ashley. So for me, um, I, oh, my experience with fatigue is kind of, um, the way that I kind of approached it with my rheumatologist was to actually say I'm sleeping this many hours a night and this I'm taking X amount of naps and sleeping for this amount of time. So quantifying it was much easier to them to be able to like, Oh, okay. This really is disrupting your life. You're sleeping 12 hours at night and then an additional, you know, two and a half, three every day. So kind of putting that across to them and sort of them understanding it's kind of it's been difficult for me to be honest with you I don't Mm -hmm. know that I have a great answer for that I think each rheumatologist sort of is different in how they sort of look at it and if your doctor is more of the type that looks at labs and needs numbers in front of them. I mean, approach it that way. There's just, I don't really have a super great answer for that. There's just not one because I don't think that fatigue is taken seriously as a symptom um, of either the disease or of the medications. I don't think that it's something that registers. They're just like, as long as your labs are okay and, you know, you're up and functional and not like needing crutches or something, you know, an aid to walk. I, th- I think they're just like, okay, you can manage the fatigue. So Chris, what is this, be- what is the better conversation that should be had about fatigue between you and your rheumatologist? So I, th- I think there's a couple of things. One, and I know we throw this term around a lot, right? As, as patients, as patient research partners and physicians, right? Shared decision-making. It really comes down to what are the goals? And my rheumatologist and I had goals. 
And, and, and I had to really think as a patient, like, what was it? If I had to trade off everything, what was the one thing I had to keep doing, right? And for me, it was work because I needed to keep my job and I needed to keep working. And so, so then it came down to, okay, well, what, what um, therapeutic options would keep me working? And then what things were getting in the way of work? And when fatigue was getting in the way of my work, and so that, those were the questions, right? It'd be like, okay, well, I can live with uh, seven o'clock. I can't do my volunteer work from seven to nine. When I was having to leave work at three in the afternoon because I had to go home and go to bed, I knew that it was disrupting my life and we needed to, to fix something. But I wasn't always the first one to come up with that, right? So I would always come in. I was the patient. I still am. Everything's good, doc. Love you. You're great, right? I don't want to upset the apple cart. And then it was sort of peeling away the onion a little bit. And, and after we had built a relationship, you know, that I'd be like, well, how are you doing? Like, are you able to work a full day? I know that's what you want. That's your goal, right? So having those things, can you still garden? Can you take care of your grandchildren? Can you take care of your kids? And, and what role are these different aspects of your disease having in, in taking away from what's most important to you? And a lot of times it is fatigue. I also hear from many patients who will say that fatigue is that symptom that creeps back in. So it slowly creeps back in to a point where all of a sudden you realize that it's taken back over your life in a certain point. It's often a sign that maybe a drug isn't working anymore, or the stress is there back in your life, or you need to readjust maybe something within your treatment program. Um, and it can be a sign sometimes to folks like I'm about to have a flare, or I'm about to, to do worse, um, as this slowly creeps back in. So Ashley said it, it it's hard sometimes, because it, it is sort of insidious, it kind of creeps back into a point where it takes takes over, or it could be like Tina, where it's just always there and you're having to manage around it. And, um, and I think that's, again, part of that decision-making with the physician probably didn't answer your question, Jack, but. Well, I think this is, I don't think there is a, I, I don't, I haven't heard a good one from a rheumatologist yet either, to be honest with you. Um, you know, we're, we're pretty good at saying, you know, it's, you know, not my fault, not my job, my, I, you know, I've done all I can do. And that's not obvious. But I think this, the, if, you, if you focus on shared decision-making and shared decision-making is, we think we do it by having conversations at the end of the visit, you know, uh, and whatnot. But I think to me, the best line in shared decision-making is when Tina says to me, you know, I'm the expert of me. And I'm going, all right, all right. Yeah. I mean, I may be the, I may be the expert of PSA, but you are the expert of you, which means I got to listen to you and, and really let you into the story. And, and when you accept that, then you get it. And if you get into shared decision-making, you, it is constantly finding common solutions. And that's one through discourse, through, through education, three through, you know, decision aids. Like if everybody hand, had a handout about fatigue, here are the things we got to talk about. What do you want to, what looks, look, it looks like a productive area for you. And I think that's how you do it. But but again, we should continue to hash this out because it is such a big area. I want to get to who manages you. I mean, um, I know we're, we're all rheumatology here, but there is this issue right now about whether we should have co-management by derm and by room. Um, and, and if you're like Ashley and you don't have a lot of skin, seeing the room makes a lot of sense. But if you do have skin involvement, should you be seeing the derm? Um, have any of you seen both at the same time? And is that doable? So I see both, um, even though I don't have a whole lot of skin, um, you know, uh, coverage, but um, I see my dermatologist about once a year, but my rheumatologist who does all of my biologics and my DMARD, I will see every three months. So um, I think there is a really good idea of having both, especially with psoriatic arthritis, because there is that skin component, even if you don't have a whole lot of activity like me, um, I think it's still really important to be able to check in with your dermatologist and your rheumatologist 
and make sure that everything's sort of going the way that you, you know, your goals are. Makes sense. Um, Chris, do you see one or both? Um, I always have a dermatologist. Um, hadn't uh, in, you know, um, I moved a couple of years ago and I hadn't, but then, you know, all of a sudden my skin had more involvement and the rheumatologist is like, yeah, beyond my, you know, I, I don't want to handle that. So absolutely seeing the, the dermatologist is really important at a minimum for skin checks, right? I, I couldn't leave the call without saying, you know, yearly skin checks are really important in, in patients on, on various therapies that they're taking for PSA. Yes. So, um, and, and I think probably the derms would, um, you know, be the ones to do that. I do think though, uh, as both are equally capable of, of helping manage psoriatic arthritis to various forms, it's important to sort of pick who, who is, you know, where are your primary symptoms line? And then how do you communicate between the two of them, right? And so sometimes the patient has to be the, the, the transmitter of that information. So, you know, luckily, um, recently I saw my derm. She's like, oh, I think we stay the course. I'm like, good. My room wants to stay the course as well. So let's stay the course, right? We'll all stay the course and, um, you know, signing lots of papers so they can share notes back and forth and, and we can communicate and we're all on the same page. So luckily, I've never been in the situation where one has had a different perspective than the other. And we had to manage that. Um, and, and I do think that there would be patients probably unlike Tina, Ashley and myself who might, that could be very challenging for them, right? Being stuck between a, a room and a derm who feel differently about managing the disease. But I, I do also think that for psoriatic arthritis, there's been so much work and education going on for co-management that, um, that it's become very, very collaborative over the years. So I, I think it's really important that if patients need both, that they have both. And, and I think the rheumatologists work well with their local dermatologists to, to help with that co-management. Let me go one step further. Who manages the comorbidity? Comorbidity is a gigantic issue in psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. You know, obesity, higher, you know, heart pro higher degree of heart problems, a number of different comorbidities. And, um, you know, most rheumatologists think, well, my, the primary care is going to man manage that. But I, I know from the research, most of my patients don't have a primary care doctor because they think I know everything and that I, I do everything. But yet I'm not willing to get on you about your hemoglobin A1C and your vaccinations and whatever. So are you as patients aware that someone's got to manage the medical side of you, the comorbidity side of you? Tina, what do you do? Um, well, I learned the hard way. Uh, years ago, I had a colon rupture and almost died. And then a few years after that, I had a hemorrhagic stroke. And I'm even an educator around that. And here's, here's been my experience. There's a lot of education that is needed around comorbidities for people with um, psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. I've spoken to thousands and thousands and thousands of audiences over the last 22 years. And I'm telling you, there is an opportunity for growth. I, I hired a functional medicine doctor after my colon ruptured and started really getting into and realizing I had so many issues I had to deal with. So um, between you, Dr. Kush, and then now Dr. Dow and um, my functional medicine. And now that I'm a very educated patient, which is what I tell most patients, be your own advocate learn about your disease, learn about how to take care of yourself and realize that nobody's going to give more time and attention to your disease than you are. So um, I think that's why this educational component is so important. And I have to just say, I have never had a physician, rheumatologist, or even a primary care really make that big of an issue around my uh, comorbidities, which is why I'm so passionate about speaking about it. I think it's something that needs to be more reiterated in physician training that you really need to talk to your patients about these sort of things. I have high right. blood pressure. Mine wasn't managed properly and I had a hemorrhagic stroke. So, um, 
I think collaboration is great. And by the way, I think derms and rooms working together is awesome. I have found as my experience, even there's a lot of derms that are still not as comfortable with biologics as I think they should be moving along. And rheumatologists have been really comfortable with biologics for many, many years. So I think derms could learn a lot from rooms and, and vice versa. So I always encourage that kind of collaboration. So you in the middle between your primary care, your room, your derm, you know, there are several ways. If you're at a medical school or an institution where they share notes, it's not an issue. I just write the note, it gets read. But most of us are not in those situations. Most of our patients aren't. Most of us practitioners are not. So you do have to have your own file, your own records, and go from, you know, from seeing me to seeing Dr. Alan Mentor and carrying my record says, I think she needs to be on the newest IL-23 inhibitor or, or whatever new therapy or that might, might need to be. And then he can address that question and then send me a note. And, that, and so, but making you an important messenger is a good way, but you got to come armed with the documents, with the papers. Don't be afraid to ask for your own, your own records and keep them and bring them like your own file from visit to visit. I think that sometimes that's the best way, unless I can get on the phone and call that, a dermatology colleague. I usually can't do that with a primary care colleague because I don't usually have, there's too many of them, right? And Dr. Kush, I really think it's important that your listeners continue to reiterate to their patients. You have to be your own advocate. Mm-hmm. Take your form. I, I never go to a doctor's appointment without my book, without my questions, without what your answers are. I can tell you every answer you've ever given me written down. Patients have to take the initiative. And many times patients won't do anything unless their doctor tells them. So I think that's another really important role for a physician to talk to your patients and remind us we have to be our own advocates and have to take the extra initiative and that it's okay. And it's, it's important because with shared decision making, we all have to be on the same page and patients have to have responsibility for taking care of their health first, my personal opinion. You know, I, I, I want to get after the three of you and put you on the hot seat. Um, I like that Chris brought up the topic of families, that there's a, a legion of people behind that person with the medical problem who are having input, who are interested, who ask 101 questions, who are second guessing everything that you're telling them after you come back from your visit. We as practitioners love it when the aunt, the uncle, the mother, the sister all come to the visit because now they're going to get from the horse's mouth what's important, what the priorities are, you know, and if they have objections, that's the time to do it. You know, to be in the cheap seats and second guessing everything I do, you know, I'm, if I hear that happening in my clinic, I'm calling up and wanting to speak to the husband or the mother and say, listen, please come to the next visit. You'd be doing my patient a great service by offering emotional support. So how do you handle the management of the people behind you? You know, that's your support system as well. Do you, do you engage them aggressively? Do you ask them to come along to visits? Do you follow up with them and keep them on, on the same page as you? Or do you feel like you've got to do it alone? I'm actually kind of lucky because my uh, rheumatologist and my dermatologist, um, my mom shares the exact same ones. <laughs> so, you know, if she has a question about it, she just, you know, goes and asks. <laughs> I don't really have to do a whole lot of management there. But we have always had family history of autoimmune stuff. And so, you know, when my grandfather was dealing with rheumatoid back in the 90s, you know, all they would really give him would be, you know, maybe a steroid, which he didn't really take. Or um, I remember him getting his joint, his knee joint drained. So, you know, the medications and stuff are, I don't have to educate so much on the but family history. Um, I'm not interested in, I'm interested in family support. Right. And what I'm saying is because of that history that we already have, like I didn't have to explain a whole lot about the disease aspect of it and what that entails. Um, the medications I definitely do. And I, I basically just come with patient notes Mm -hmm. if they have questions like from the patient portal or whatever. And 
I get it straight from the horse's mouth, really. I have a lot of support. And just like you said, uh, Chris, is such a great point. I've had to explain after every visit, phone calls are, and, mm-hmm. and I'm pretty aggressive and wouldn't follow uh, a doctor's suggestions if I didn't really believe in them and think they really cared about me and had genuine empathy. So um, I've got really good support and they usually kind of go with what I think because they know I'm kind of hard on doctors, Dr. Cush. So when I really have great support from a physician, they know it and they just support me. I I wrote a blog blog about you got to be as a patient, you got to be the CEO of your own health. Yes. And if that's, if you're the CEO and you're making CEO level decisions all the time, what positions are held by your family? Chris. I just want to make sure they can't hear me. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, I think you know they're they're the supporters, they're the cheerleaders, right? They're the folks who who you need to lean on when when you're having a tough time, and you need them to understand it enough so that they have faith that you can relay the information and, and have confidence, right? And I talk about giving patients the confidence to be able to go back and stand up to some of the challenges they get from the family. That does come over time though. That That's not going to happen with the first diagnosis right in the first time the patient goes home. But I think, you know, a doctor checking in, how does your family feel about this? How are things going at home? How's your is your husband okay with the choices that we've made, right? Opens up that door sometimes to to being able to have a conversation to send maybe patients back for for different kinds of of education. Uh, You know, I I can't tell you how many times I beat my head against the wall trying to share some of the information and the decisions I made, but it was taking that Tina approach of being very um, firm and say, no, we made this decision together. I'm on board with this decision. I agree with this decision and this is where we're going to go. And yeah, there's some upside and yeah, there's potential downside. Here's what it looks like, but where I am right now, I'm prepared to, to make those trade-offs. It, it, it can be hard. And, and I think back to your question about, um, you know, comorbidities, Right. I think that's also something to be really honest and upfront with the family about. Um, the disease made me rethink that cholesterol level that maybe I kept thinking I could manage with my diet and exercise, which clearly I couldn't. Right. Um, it made me think about who was going to take care of that. Um, rheumatologists may have great relationships with internal medicine docs or PCPs. Luckily, my um, IMs have always known as soon as I've said the diagnosis, they've said, you're at greater risk for X, Y, and Z, and I'm going to watch you really closely. But they, luckily they were, and that wasn't because I chose them that way. I just fell upon that. Otherwise I would probably take the papers in and give them to them and say, please read up a little bit more. And I'd like to take care uh, of these areas, but you have to share that with your family too. Why maybe you've changed your diet a little bit, why you're, um, managing your, your blood pressure. So at some point you have to make some tough decisions about your, what happened in the visit, a new, a new medication, a new direction, a new, whatever. Um, so I want to actually ask a polling question of the audience. Um, and Shannon, if you can pull up that polling question, the question is, and I want my panelists to think about this. If an MD wants to change your therapy, um, thinking that he can, you can do better, meaning you, you're doing okay, but you still have activity in skin or joints, but they want to change your therapy. Why would a patient not want to change therapy? I'm going to ask the audience to poll, to answer the, this question now and um, pick one answer, what you think is the best answer as to what you've seen in your patients about what they do, what they, why they don't do. You know, this is an underlying uh, factor when it comes to Um, adherence to medicines, you know, in certain disorders, um, we write a prescription and less than, you know, 40% of patients fill the prescription. When it comes to a PSA patient on a biologic, I think it's above 50%. I know it's not 75% who will take it as it was prescribed. And that's a little bit surprising to some people. Uh, And so the question is, you know, why do we um, 
Why might there be doubt in your mind? Or, do, or is there no doubt? The patient's usually uh, perfectly aligned with the physician. That's certainly an option there. So um, can my panelists see these results yet? No? Okay. No. So uh, go ahead and uh, I'll, I'll end the poll and let's, uh, let's share the poll. Let me do that. Can you see it? No. All right. So um, why don't you share that, um, Shannon? Fear of unknown. You can see it? Fear of unknown. So fear of unknown meds is uh, one of the leading answers. Next would be safety concerns. Um, not so important is um, going along with the doctor. Um, but um, but I, I sort of frame the question like you might have doubts about this thing. And you're not so much concerned with losing control. It's really basically all the things you don't know because you're used to whatever drug you're getting, whatever injectable or pill. So um, I guess to my panelists, do these results surprise you? No. 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 They're right on track. Yeah. Really? Well, so, fear of unknown meds, when you think about all the medications we're having to take, I know that's been my biggest challenge with my family and friends. Mm -hmm. Tina, you're on so many medications. It scares them all to death on how many drugs I'm on and right. how they interact with each other. So I think that's a really good concern for all of us. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, and, and there's a question in the chat around this as well. Right. So I always, if I think that it, for me, at least in my experience, having uh, the rheumatologist pull up the notes and flip back a few pages and say, Hey, listen, three months ago, you were here two months or six months ago, three months ago today, you're here you're clearly not getting any better. And as a matter of fact, you've told me X, Y, and Z. I think we need to make a change. My rheumatologist would sort of get this far off look. And, and I could tell that he was pulling up the cytokine network in his, in his, in his uh, peripheral vision and going through and saying, okay, so we've targeted this, we've targeted this. We know these factors of your disease are controlled by these cytokines. And maybe that was a little more than you would normally share with a, with a, with your, with a patient. But for me, it was very helpful. And to say the next logical place I would go would be X because I've already tried this pathway. There's multiple pathways. I think we need to move to a new pathway, or I think we need to do that. Or the latest literature would say X. Those are all things that give patients great confidence in saying, I'm with you, right? Yeah, I want to feel better. You're right. The last six months, was it that bad? Really? Tell me what I, oh, wow. Okay. Then the patient sort of comes out of denial and says, yeah, you're right. You know what? Those numbers show that's hard evidence to say I'm getting worse and I have faith in you as a rheumatologist and there's a plethora of medications that target multiple different pathways. Let's try a new one. Um, then it's really speaking to what would be the differences between the trade-offs I've already made to be on the medication I'm on today, right? So once you've got someone to make those trade-offs, now you're really not making trade-offs from scratch again. You're making trade-offs from where I am today with the current medication I'm on to say, and these are the additional things or, or the not additional things. This is maybe going to get better. This might be a little bit worse. And, and it's, a, it's a dialogue and a dance with the patient. And again, it comes back to shared decision-making. Yeah. I want to um, ask a quick question. What do you prefer, pills or injections? You've done both. Give me a quick answer injections for, for me. Injections. injections for me all the way. Okay. Ashley. Yeah, injections. Chris. Um, I, I, I take both. So I, I have no barrier to an injection or an infusion. I'm going to be, I'm going to be neutral here in Switzerland. Uh, but you know, I, I have no, no issue with any of those. Um, just remember that for a pill, patients, as Tina said, are on multiple other medications. So, and most of those are pills already. So I don't know about the rest of the ladies on the panel, but I, I have a, one of those, my grandma's pillbox, right? To keep track of all the pills that I have to take to be compliant. So um, none of them scare me anymore. Um, yeah. So David Liu, a uh, rheumatologist in Australia, asked a great question about 
something you brought up, we brought up earlier, at that moment that you get diagnosed, what could have gone better? Um, assuming that you were in front of someone knowledgeable, like a dermatologist or a rheumatologist, what could have gone better? What would you, what would your advice be to that doctor? Because each of you probably have your own little um, drawn out story of, of disappointment before you got to where you needed to be. What could, what could have gone better? Tina? Dr. Chris, I'm going to be really quick because mine was so life altering. My, my first diagnosis and you're right, Chris, I'll never forget the moment and the doctor and the experience. What could have gone better was the physician walking into the room, greeting me, having empathy, speaking directly to me and saying, you have a condition called psoriatic arthritis and it's going to be difficult to manage. We don't have a lot of treatments, but here's what we're going to do. And we're going to try to help you. And we're going to work with you to manage this disease. Instead, my rheumatologist first visit came in and said, you're going to be crippled in a wheelchair in five years. Have your parents get you on disability. You won't be able to walk. It's terribly degenerative. Hey, do you have any more questions? And walked out of the room. So for me, that was a devastating, de and I've told that story a thousand times, if, if not more, because there was no compassion, there was no empathy. And if you remember, Dr. Kush, I told you a year later, I went back to the same rheumatologist paid $92 for an office visit that was years ago and told the doctor, please never do that to another patient. Because if you would have said that to a shy, timid patient, you have to give patients hope no matter what you do, no matter what you say or what you prescribe. We come in there at our worst, most vulnerable time. We're tired. We're exhausted. We're afraid. We're intimidated by doctors. We, we're, we're not in a good place. So we really need hope and encouragement. So for me, the doctor that had given a little kindness, a little humanity, a little extra effort saying, I am so sorry this is happening to you at 17 years old. Can't imagine what you're feeling. That would have changed the course of my life in a, in a different direction. Ashley, what would you advise? Um, I got a phone call um, <laughs> after my labs had come in. So um, I wasn't even told in person and it was just Called, made the call, you have an inflammatory arthritis, here's the pill, that's it. Um, so I would advise if you're going to make that diagnosis to make sure that you are telling that person in, in person, the patient wow. in person, and please never do that through a patient portal message, through a phone call, um, just please don't ever do that. <laughs> There's not the right way to do it. <laughs> Chris, do you have any words? Yeah, I, I would say, um, very similar to, to both Tina and Ashley, um, in person with some empathy and, and be honest, um, with what you know and what you don't know. Right. And, and the fact that, you're, we're in it together. So, you know, the rheumatologist took my hand and said, Hey, I got good news and bad news. Right. And uh, what do you want first? And I said, okay, give me the bad news. Uh, it's pretty clear. You have psoriatic arthritis. And I said, okay, well, what's good news. I'm here with you and we're going to figure it out together. Cause I really care about you. And we're going to get you the best medicine. And there's a lot of different ways we can go. There's a lot of studies ongoing because this was a while ago and, and we're going to work on this together. And I got your back. And, and that just gave me relief to say, hey, you know what? Um, because I had been seeing another doctor who was running a battery of tests. And every time I went in, it was more blood work and more blood work and more blood work, but not that conversation to say, I don't really know what's going on, right? Like be, be honest and say, I don't really know what's going on. So we're gonna get more blood work and we're gonna do a few more things. I think it might be this, but I need this is really helpful. And because it's very unsettling for the patient to leave every visit with more lab work, less certainty, and, and then the patient starts to lose confidence and they are going to go find someone else where they have more confidence. So own up to the fact that we're just going to make really good decisions together. And neither one of us maybe really knows exactly where it's going to go, but we're going to do it together. Yeah. I, I, I like that a lot. Um, I want to hit on something else that, um, I think David gave me, uh, uh, David Lou gave me this question even before the session started. I, each of you has been at your worst at one time or another. 
you know, really bad, but then you found your way to your best. How did you get there? How do you navigate that? I mean, it's, it helps if someone gives you the right drug, but there's a lot of things that you have to do. So how do you navigate? How did you navigate from your worst to your best? What's your advice to the docs? What's your advice to other patients? Tina, go ahead. Well, my worst was after my stroke and I was told I could never have another anti-inflammatory drug. And I think I called you right after that, Dr. Cush, and you did the best that you could to put me at ease and said, Tina, we're going to come up with a protocol. We're going to figure out how we're going to do it. I was devastated because I was in so much pain. I'd been on anti-inflammatories since I was 17. So um, for me, having a plan and having confidence in my doctor and having you say to me, encouraging words and affirmation that there's, we're going to get through this together. And I think I remember you saying, don't you dare change one thing until you ask me first. Remember that moment, but you were very engaged in my healthcare and you gave me support and encouragement. And that's what got me through it to be quite frank, my support system and you giving me the, the hope that I could manage this disease. And it hadn't been easy, but I have followed your protocol and still do. And I'm, I'm managing and I'm getting through it. Chris, how did you navigate it? I, I think I, I woke up from my, you know, my worst moment, um, having been put on IV steroids and of course I felt terrible and I put on a ton of weight and everyone around me knew I was miserable and I was still in pain. And I realized there was no one sort of miracle, right. That was going to take place. And I knew what the comorbidity risk was. And I, I sort of said, Hey, you know, put on your big girl pants and take charge. You know, you're going to have to lose weight. You're going to have to take better care of yourself. You're going to have to take a little bit more care of this. You can't keep going through as many medications as you have find some other outlets. And, um, but it was really tough, right? It was, and it was going to be a really long road and I knew it was going to be a really long road. And so every time I sort of start to feel that way, I go like, this is my life. I need to take charge. No one has the magic bullet right now to fix me. So I have to own this just as much as any medical appointment does to, to take better care of myself. And it wasn't that I wasn't taking care of myself. I was doing everything I could, but I had just kind of gotten to rock bottom of and realized three grams of of steroid over three days wasn't going to fix me either. As a matter of fact, that was probably made me feel the worst that I had ever felt in my life. Right. And, and, uh, and that's when I was like, yeah, you know what, like, I, I need to own a little bit more and take a bit more control, but it was tough. It, and that was not an easy thing for me to do. And it was, and it's not easy for patients and that may not be what everyone needs. Right. But for me, that's what worked. Uh, again, I'm, I'm not Chris's rheumatologist, but I do know after we talked about this, she did have a dramatic change in her diet. Um, she went no carb and, and that did result in weight loss. And, you know, she was back to, you know, exercising and it really showed as far as your activity and, you know, you know, when you're doing good, everyone knows you're not doing good, just looking at your face and your movements and stuff like that. So that was a very, um, deliberate choice that you made. Ashley, how did you navigate worst to best? Um, I really had to have a lot of trust in myself and in my support system to know that I would get through this. This is a temporary thing. And um, I honestly, the best thing that I could have done was trust my own instincts and, um, and just have a great support system that backed me. Um, and trusted in me enough to know that I would arrive at the best possible answer <laughs> for myself. Um, so I would say 100% trust. I think that those are very telltale. I want to end with a, um, uh, a, a request. You know, there's a, there's a number of things that bother you. But what's the one thing that bothers you in your care and evaluations and doctor visits that doctors just don't seem to notice or get? We talked about fatigue, but what's the one thing that, that you wish they would pay more attention to? Is that, is that evident in, in your daily 
for monthly visits that you have to your doctors? I want to impress this upon our, our listeners. Is there something that they should be taking note of that they're not? Dr. Kush, I'd say two quick things because uh, I know we're out of time. Number one, please hire and train and appreciate a really great staff because your staff is really important to us as patients. They're the huge support system behind you and their attitude and how they handle us as patients is a reflection of you and your values and your, your principles. So I think a kind, compassionate, competent staff, really, really important. And secondly, I think it's really important to take in the whole patient that there are so many quality of life issues with a disease like psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis. All of these different aspects have to be considered. If you're going to do the best by the patient and yourself as a, as a, as a caregiver, it's important to know that there's so many additional factors other than just getting us the right medicines or the right treatments, seeing us as a whole person and, uh, is really important and showing compassion and empathy to us is going to determine whether we're going to be compliant, whether we're going to come back or whether we're going to follow up with treatment. So I think that's very important. Ashley, is there something you wish the doctors would notice or pay more attention to? Um, yeah, I, I think Tina kind of hit it, the whole person. And one of the things that I truly wish that rheumatologists would um, speak more to you is how diet and exercise affect the disease itself. Um, and I don't get a whole lot of direction, um, in those arenas, but it would be great to have some sort of like, here's an anti-inflammatory diet, or maybe going gluten-free might help. Um, just even anything, or even just saying you might want to talk with your GP or your endocrinologist or whoever about um, about your nutrition and your diet and exercising. And Chris, so uh, I'm gonna, you know, maybe this is the the, the crazy part of me, but I. I really um, enjoy having sort of knowing my numbers, knowing my numbers, right? I would encourage doctors to embrace some type of a, a tool, a measurement tool. There's a lot out there. There's um, a lot that have been done with patients and for patients. Um, P said, um, past us, there's other scoring measures, CP die, right, that are out there, something that can be embraced so that you have some score that you can look at with your patient and say, you're getting better, you're not getting better. And then I would say, don't forget a joint count. I can't tell you how many times I've been to see my rheumatologist and, and we've just had a GP visit. My joints <coughs> haven't been touched. Um, and that troubles me a little bit because I'm going to see a rheumatologist who specializes in joints, right? So um, to me, finding a way to incorporate that into the exam so that, it, again, it adds to that confidence piece. And then that, that, that quantifiable measurement tool that allows the two, the physician and the patient to work together around a tool that can be used in the office, can be easily incorporated in that allows you to sort of look at your progress and how you're doing will help tee up those conversations of needing to change therapies, add therapies, or whether you stay the course. That's great sage advice. I really appreciate it. Um, I want to thank our panel, um, Ashley Kravalovic, um, Chris Lindsay and Tina Brown, you're all wonderful. Great. Thank you for all you do for psoriatic disease. And thank you for being part of this particular panel. I want to uh, remind our audience that this recording will be available on Room Now. It'll be available as a podcast um, in, a, in about a few days if you want to share it with your colleagues and friends and other patients. Um, future Tuesday Night Rheumatologies are going to be two journal clubs on the 12th and 26th. Both of those will have two articles being presented. And then on the 19th, we have a rheumatologist panel, um, major KOLs talking about controversies in PSA care. Thank you very much and have a great night.